today's episode of the unwritten rule got a good show for you guys got some football stuff a little bit of housekeeping to take care of we have a a schedule update we got a new date for the missouri or the murray state game not missouri state uh shout out conzo martin the murray state game for mizzou football and then uh, a couple of transfer portal guys entering the transfer portal from the football team as well so we'll talk about that and then uh men's hoop same thing we got a uh, marcus warwick the northern kentucky uh guard is visiting so we're going to talk a little bit about him uh, i know some people have probably seen his stats and stuff on twitter so we'll talk about what we think of him maybe uh if we like uh, him maybe potentially to join a Mizzou men's basketball because he'll be on a visit. Uh, and then we have a great interview. Talk to Matt Michaels. He is the uh, Mizzou baseball color commentator on the radio. So uh, he joined the show. It was a great interview with him. Uh, talked to him about Mizzou's uh, decent, decent ish start to the year uh, and the Florida sweep, especially kind of the hype they've been getting. So um, good interview with Matt. It was nice to have him on the show. Uh, first new, first time guest for, for, first time in a little while so that's fun uh and then we finish with quick hits we got jerseys shawnee's main birds and then the best things we learned so good show for everyone to uh to get your weekend started it's our first show uh back together also we like finally have like a uh all three of us back in the same room there's been a bunch of traveling a bunch of hullabaloo so appreciate everybody for sticking with but we're all uh we're all back uh here in one room together so um yeah Plenty of stuff to get into before we do that. A uh, quick word from the sponsor, Bet Online. Uh, it is your number one source for all your summer sports this season, from MLB to golf to NBA to the NHL playoffs. Uh, all the latest stats, news, scores available, all uh, to follow your favorite teams. Get the latest odds and lines, including the latest team matchups, player props, and odds on just about every sport out there. So head to the website today and use your uh, mobile device to get in on the action. Bet Online, it's where the game starts. Got Masters this week. You can bet on that. Um, and yeah, plenty of stuff to dive into with that. Let's get the show started. The unwritten rule starts right now. I just, I... Marcel, where are you going with that disc? You are not putting that on again. Marcel, okay, if you press that button, you are in very, very big trouble. Attention, everybody stop what you're doing. It's time for The Unwritten Rule, a Mizzou sports podcast brought to you by the Believe Network, alongside Peyton Haverman. And Kenny Van Doren. Here is your host, Jack Knowlton. Welcome back to the Unwritten Rule. Today is Friday, April 12th. And before we get started, Kenny and Peyton brought something to my attention in the intro. Uh, I have not been kidnapped. I know my lighting and backdrop look terribly bland. Uh, I just moved, and so I don't have a desk or good lighting like I did where I used to live. So I have not been kidnapped. I'm not doing this podcast against my will. Kenny and Peyton are not uh, are not holding me for ransom. Anyway, uh, let's get into the let's get into the show, guys. Uh, we got we got some football stuff to dive into. Got some basketball stuff to talk about as well. First and foremost, it's nice to have the three of us all back on a show. Uh, we appreciate everyone you sticking with the two man shows for a little bit. Don't but, get used uh, to it. <laughs> um, yeah, we're we're back, but uh, Mizzou football has a little bit of a schedule change. Uh, they're going to be playing Thursday night football. Uh, the Murray State game at the beginning of the season got moved to Thursday. It's now August 29th at 7 p.m. on SEC Network. Um, I I enjoyed this. Like they had, I th- was the last Thursday the Louisiana Tech game when they had a standalone. Those are kind of fun, I guess. Last start. year they did it too, South Dakota. Oh, it was last year too. Okay. So I, I don't mind these standalone games, especially when you're playing like kind of a crummy team. Be a chance for the national audience to see, you know, Mizzou after what they kind of did last year. Not only do I not mind it, I actually think it should become like permanent for Mizzou. I think Mizzou should make this their tradition. Uh, there's just a myriad of reasons to do it. The only drawback to it is that having your season opener on Thursday against a crummy opponent likely means you're not going to like, you may have a harder time selling that out, but maybe not because now you're becoming such a better program that you may sell out anyway. So, I mean, this is a, like you, like you touched on, uh, like it has been the last two years, good way to get like a standalone kind of spot on the national stage. There's no other sec games you're rubbing up against. Um, and Missouri is going to be, I believe, 
a top 10 team in the AP poll. Uh, so Missouri's going to be a top 10 team playing all alone on a Thursday. That's going to get some eyes. Um, so it's a good place to showcase you. It's also interesting because we always gave Desiree credit for this. Obviously, Desiree is no longer in the fold um, and they still were able to pull this off. So I don't know who's making this decision, but I like it. It plays into a lot of uh, Labor Day weekend as well. Uh, you you have that Thursday and then people come to Columbia for the whole weekend or just, you know, go somewhere else for the whole weekend. It kind of just plays into a, a nice four day weekend for a lot of fans and people traveling through Columbia to see the Tigers and then on to wherever else they're going. Um, I like the move a lot. Uh, I, th- I think it's good this year that's on the SEC network as well. Um, I think in years past it was on ESPNU. So this is, I mean, a little bit of a step up and you get to play that game on the SEC network. That's a good point with the Labor Day thing. I didn't think about that because then it's like kids, you know, might go home or students might do like a little vacation at the beginning of the year, whatever people like to do for Labor Day. Um, so, yeah, it keeps them, uh, gives them a game to go to that doesn't interfere as much with that longer weekend. Um, so, yeah, I guess scheduling wise, it makes sense there. But, yeah, I think it's fun. Uh, I didn't mind the standalone games. I felt like, you know, when I would have friends that would text me who weren't Mizzou fans that would be the game they would text me the most about just because they would happen to be watching sports that night and just see Missouri on a standalone. So it'd be like everyone's craving football and Missouri kind of just gets to answer that. I guess. Yeah. That, that, that I think is a, that, that could be a fun tradition going forward a little Thursday night football. Um, but yeah, that'll be, that'll be exciting. I know absolutely nothing about Murray state football. Uh, maybe they can let John Morant play. They have a chance. I don't know. Um, but yeah, Missouri. We really won't need to out. learn about Murray State. Let's just. <laughs> yeah, out there. I mean, that's I don't, not a game we have to worry about. We don't need to do. We don't want to do an advanced scout on Murray State in our preview before that game in August. You guys don't. I mean, like we, we, we we will preview it. I don't know how advanced it needs to be. Let's I look. It should be. Yeah, Let's take a quick look. Can you right, tell me where into- in where what state um, Murray State is? Kentucky, like? Tennessee. Oh, it's Kentucky. No, you're right. <laughs> Do you Good know what one, I was guys. thinking of? I was thinking of Chattanooga. I was thinking of Chattanooga. I got that. That movie. is indeed. That's in Tennessee. Not where it is. Let's see. Here, here you go. Nine? Wait, That's wait. it. Go back up. That's a two and nine. Yes. Dog, they scored oh, 16 points a game. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe they brought in a big oh. recruiting class. Oh, can you look up man. On, can you look up their on three uh, team ranking? Where are they? How many four? No, that up. there's no way it. that's a thing. <laughs> Dude, okay. wow! I did not realize they were that bad last year. At least South Dakota had been good the year before, and yeah, even Murray made. The, I think they made the playoff last year. So Mizzou better, Mizzou better not App State Michigan themselves. That would be bad. Um, App yeah, State so won the FCS game. title that year. I don't think there's a, 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 a. I don't think I think they'll be okay. There you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, so yeah, August 29th, 7 p.m. SEC Network. Don't forget that week Missouri plays on a Thursday standalone game. Um, other football stuff with three guys enter the portal. Um, Kai Montgomery, Ryan Horst Camp, and Michael Cox. Uh, I'll let you guys weigh in on this. We, I think if we do the math, I think they combined for about one appearance last season. So doesn't seem like there's too much of a shocker there that they're in the portal. And, um, you know, some some decent like recruiting numbers there for those guys. Michael Cox played a bunch in 2022 uh, when Mizzou wasn't very good. But, uh, yeah, the three of them, tight end, Ryan Horsecamp, defensive lineman, Kai Montgomery, and then Michael Cox, the running back, all planning on enter the, entering the transfer portal. Feels like to me, Peyton and Kenny, just like your typical, uh, you know, you're getting rid of kind of the fodder. Uh, so to speak, some of the guys that are just fringe and going to try and get some opportunity somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, Ryan Horsecamp was kind of a one play wonder. Um, he was, he had that one touchdown that I'm sure Kenny will enlighten us more about um, against New Mexico State. And that felt like a big moment because, again, that, that 2022 tight end room was such a bad group that it just felt monumental. Like, I mean, Kibet Chep uh was the top tight end there for a bit. I mean, he would, he had, I can remember three catches he had that year and they were all on the same like route against Auburn. Uh, there was Tyler Stevens who is still around, still around Tyler Stevens. Um, he wasn't all that good, but he had that touchdown catch against Georgia. That was one handed. 
Um, and then there was Ryan Horskamp, who actually had a little bit of buzz because he was young. I believe he was a redshirt freshman. Um, and he 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 was like a top 450 recruit, I believe is what that tweet said. And then uh, the other two, Kai Montgomery, just unfortunate for him because injuries kept slowing him down. Uh, Michael Cox, that tweet mentioned he had 150 yards um, rushing in 2021. I think like 75 of those came on one run against SEMO. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, you're not losing a whole ton here. Like, these guys probably will find a spot to there where they can get some playing time. I just didn't see a path for that there. Yeah, you can see 55 was uh, Michael Cox's longest rush. Uh, I believe that was in garbage time against SEMO. Yeah, it was just depth. Um, you're losing depth in these three guys. Uh, for Kai Montgomery, it was the knee injury. He had a lot of hype coming out of him um, his first two years, and just really not didn't really get to see the the playing field because of those knee injuries. I honestly, I saw him in the airport after the Gasparilla Bowl in 2022, and I thought that was the last time I'd ever see him because I thought he would enter the portal. Then he stuck around for another year. Didn't get to see the field with a loaded defensive line room and a lot of guys in front of him with more experience. Um, so he's He's, he's in the portal. I, I like that he called himself a free agent because I guess that's what uh, a lot of transfer guys can now consider themselves moving forward. Uh, for Ryan Horskamp, yeah, it was that one catch. He did have another catch in that game against New Mexico State for no gain. And from there, I actually wrote a feature about it called, like, Welcome to Horskamp. Talked to his high school coach, and he said, you know, he had that offer from Alabama. And a lot of teams were knocking at his door really late in his recruitment um, in the class of 2021. And then... He ended up just coming to Mizzou. He stayed home, and I was thinking about it a couple months ago. It's like if there's one guy that's probably not getting much, enough playing time or not getting any playing time, and like Ryan Horskamp, I think he would stay just because. I mean, this is like kind of like one of those Brady Cook situations. He wanted to play for Mizzou, and that's the school he always dreamed of. Um, I think he could land at like a Mac school. I think uh, there was Max Wies Weisner who left uh, earlier in the, uh, the first transfer window, and. He ended up at a max school, so I think there's an opportunity for Ryan Horskamp to do the same. Maybe we'll do the reverse. Tyler Stevens go to Buffalo. Come, there they'll, go. They'll, they'll, they'll flip flop. Um, he's the player to be named later. Yeah, I don't think I don't think any of these names exactly flew off the page for me, making you nervous uh, depth wise standpoint. Obviously, uh, you know we'll see where Mizzou. We're we're getting near now that that second transfer window where Mizzou will probably bring in some more reinforcements. So. Uh, you know, we'll have we'll have a watch on there, so to speak. Uh, see what guys they go after, but those three uh, will not be around next season. Looking for looking for new homes. Hopefully, Ryan Horsecamp can I don't know make a a one hit wonder. That's wild. He had an offer from like Alabama and things like that, and just didn't didn't wind up working out. But hopefully, those guys uh, figure something out here at the at their next stops. Um, let's segue to to basketball. We got a player to talk about there. Uh, some more uh, transfer portal recruiting hype. Um, Marcus Warwick is the name we're talking about this time around. We talked about Tony Perkins, who Mizzou is is still pretty on the radar for, so we'll keep an eye on him, the Iowa transfer. Um, but Warwick recently uh, included Mizzou uh, in a list of schools. He had his top five, USC, Mizzou, Penn State, Cincinnati, and Seton Hall. Uh, this guy was at Northern Kentucky, kind of a combo guard, uh, he played at Northern Kentucky, spent four years there, 19 or almost 20 points a game, actually. Last year, about two and a half rebounds, two and a half assists, and actually 1.2 steals per game as well. So sort of a do-it-all kind of combo guard. I wouldn't expect his scoring to, to you know, stay at the level or at that level, maybe unless he, you know, he really hits wherever he goes at the Power 5 level. But yeah, Mizzou firmly in the mix with some of these schools. Obviously, now you have... Uh, the Musselman connection with USC, they're going to, I wonder if they'll become kind of the new, they'll just take what Arkansas did and be linked to every name under the sun because he's there now. Um, Seton Hall, almost a tournament team, Cincinnati in our right year, Penn State, eh. So Mizzou firmly in the mix for this guy. How do y'all, Peyton, Torvik man, does he does he grade out well? Do we like do we like Marcus Warwick as a, as a potential uh, player to come to Mizzou? Yeah, he's also visiting this weekend. Uh, it's important to note. Um, it feels more like a backup option for Tony Perkins because uh, I'll be honest, not that impressed by his Torvik page. Uh, I'll be quite frank about that. Um, 
horrible rebounding rates, very high usage rate. He doesn't turn the ball over, um, and it, but his assist rate is just kind of mediocre. Um, not a great shooter, like bad shooter from deep, like sub 30%. Uh, I, I I saw some of the Rock M guys, Rock M Nation guys. They were kind of comping him to Sean East in that kind of like style of play. Um, it's interesting. I, I don't really think this is a guy I would have at the top of my list if I was Dennis Gates. If you don't get Tony Perkins, then this is probably a good backup option. But I don't really see the need for both him and Perkins on the same roster. Um, I would probably think this is more just a backup talk about the three-point percentage and having trouble shooting it from deep i mean it's significantly fallen off over those last four seasons too i mean he was at three six uh three six one uh percent from the three point or from from three in 2021 it's dropped to 29 percent in 2024 so i mean there's a lot of you know i mean what happened there what kind of changed in his style of play um, did other things go up when some of the things went down, but, uh, there are, there's a lot of green on there, but there's also a lot of red. So like Peyton mentioned with the rebounding is probably one of the biggest issues. Yeah. And the volume didn't really get like, he took 147 threes as a freshman. So like the volume didn't, it hadn't even doubled and his, his percentage dropped that much. Um, yeah. And I think, I think Tony Perkins is the name you kind of want, uh, you know, first and foremost, but this could be maybe be a, a good backup, like you said, at six two is not you know a bigger guard, uh, which you know a lot of teams kind of trend towards now. But a good ball handler clearly can fill it up at times, at least in the Horizon League. He was first team in that league. Um, is that can he go back to his Torvik page for a second, if if I may request? I wanted to look at his at the rim stats. Yeah, like fifty percent around the rim. Um, you know, it suggests like he likes to get downhill maybe a little bit more, but. Yeah, some of his tendencies are a little bit a little bit weird if we're getting into the nitty gritty. So a name to watch, like we said, he's got the top five he's visiting this weekend. We'll see how he maybe clicks with a and a former Horizon League guy, which, of course, the league Dennis uh, coached in and would have coached against this guy, uh, I believe, in his last season at, at Cleveland State. So maybe a little bit of familiarity there. Uh, but yeah, I would I would probably lean Tony Perkins. Any other any other transfer portal thoughts, Penny Kenny or, or thoughts on Warwick? I don't know. No, I mean, still just kind of, I mean, Warwick, like you said, I mean, it, I also think uh, just looking at his Torvik, it does seem like he gets to the line a fair amount, which would, which was something Missouri did not do well last year at all. Um, but I mean, I, I just think that you probably have other needs. Um, like we said, you need really someone who can run the point. I don't think that's Warwick. I mean, the, the it's good that he doesn't turn the ball over but the assist rate is just not what you really want from a power or high major guard. Um, Tony Perkins would be the one I would probably want if I want, if Dennis Gates is dead set on getting a combo guard. Um, they still need a big man. Uh, I'm sure there, there's still a lot of names that they've been linked to that are in the portal. So still confident they can get that done. No doubt. Um, yeah, we'll have we'll have our eye. I I love this time of year. It's the the visit season, the link two season, all this stuff. Um, you know, with and Missouri's kind of continued in, in classic Dennis fashion to be linked to Warwick and uh, some of these other guys. Just just these these high level. This is this is at least good where it's not you know, it's at least a high level mid major player. Like he was a first team All Horizon. He averaged twenty points a game in his league. You know, we're not. It doesn't look like we're doing the Carolero thing anymore. Uh, you know, so at the very least, that's that's hopefully a lesson learned by Dennis Gates, and he makes do with what he ends up getting. Even if you don't love Warwick, it's definitely a better option than a guy who averaged like six and five or something in the horizon that Dennis just sees something in. So at least that's maybe a slight silver lining there. But yeah, we'll see if Warwick uh, continues to emerge as a potential addition. Maybe he'll prove us all wrong if he if he does come. But yeah, four years at Northern Kentucky, twenty points a game last season, and uh, visiting Mizzou here this weekend um any other, any other final hoops notes boys we got a uh, should we kick it to ourselves talking to talking to matt michaels we uh we had a good interview there um talking a little mizzou baseball we're gonna we're gonna keep on mizzou baseball they've had you know an all right start to the season so we got 
uh, Matt's take just on on their start on the Carrick Jackson experiment so far in year one, of course, on that big Florida sweep as well that I even saw some like national stuff on that on Twitter because it was a that was a big deal that Mizzou won that series. So, uh, yeah, we'll kick it to ourselves uh, talking to Matt Michaels, the Mizzou baseball radio color commentator uh, here on the other side. Okay, we now welcome on a very special guest. Uh, he commentates, provides color commentary from Mizzou Baseball on the radio. It is uh, Matt Michaels. First time we've had him on. We're going to have a bunch of baseball talk here as we roll into the uh, into the spring and into the late spring months here with Mizzou. And Matt, uh, I think the best place to start, first of all, thank you so much for coming on. Um, but I think the best place to start is with this uh this last series here uh, that Mizzou was in in the SEC against Florida was a big one, um, sweeping the Gators, taking them down in Columbia uh, in those three games. I want to ask you about that. Just how big was that? Because there was, you know, national stuff, pe- people talking about how big of a win that was for uh, for Mizzou over Florida as well. But uh, being there, commentating on it, you know, I know Mizzou, you know, has had you know, they've been 500 ish so far this year, but how big of a, a win was that in that series against Florida? Well, first of all, Jack, uh, Kenny and Peyton, thank you guys for having me on. You know, the significance of the series is probably a little bit beyond just three wins against a top 10 at the time, Florida Gators team. The significance really has to do with the fact that Carrick Jackson and his staff are in their first season. They have a bunch of new players on this team whether new to the team via the transfer portal or being a graduate student or new to the, to the team as freshmen. And several times four or even five freshmen have appeared in the starting lineup for Missouri this season. It's important to establish that the way they want to play ball, both from a pitching and defense perspective and an offensive perspective, works. And it worked over a weekend against a team that's very physical in Florida It's a ton of home runs generally and has some very well-regarded pitchers, but Missouri's process was able to best Florida in all three occasions because they did their things well and not necessarily because of things Florida did against them. And I think Eric Jackson called it afterwards a belief builder for his team, and that's exactly what it is. You now have a proof of concept that if you do the things that the coaching staff is trying to instill and the players are trying to execute, the good things can happen. That's really what it meant as much as anything when it comes to the standings or Hoover or any of that stuff, just the belief and the knowledge that it works and it works against high levels of competition. I know it's a different team, different staff this year. And like you said, you're trying to you know build his confidence, build the program where this team wants to go. It kind of takes me back though, to that 2023 season with that series against Tennessee, you, the number four team comes into Columbia and you sweep them in Florida on the same level, one of the best teams in the country and you sweep them at home. But it's, the season didn't really build upon there. I mean, where did the Tigers kind of go with this, you know, beating Florida? How do they build upon this going into Georgia and, and onward? Well, you saw last season a Missouri team beat Tennessee that I think had all elements of their game. And that team was a little bit more offensively minded than this one is, you know, with Luke Mann as an anchor. And Zeitler provided a bunch of pop, too. And you saw the Tigers hit a bunch of home runs. Trevor Austin really stepped up and provided some of that pop as well for the team a season ago. And this team is not as offensive. And last year's team got doomed by pitcher injuries. And it started from the beginning of the season. You didn't have a full season of Tony Newbeck or Ian Losey. And you had Javen Pimentel down for quite a while. You know, those things just started to mount up. Sam Horn was electric in his collegiate debut. And then he didn't get to see him after just uh, an inning in the second weekend of the season. And those sorts of things have happened early on this season to the Tigers. I mean, they're without some pitchers that really could help them in the form of Will Libert and Newbeck is down again. And, you know, I could go down the list, but the fact of the matter is that this team has known that for a while and this team has still had consistent pitching and maybe more deep pitching behind it. A lot of the freshmen who were thrown into the fire last year, you know, the Brock Lucases and Daniel Whistlers and on and on. Well, they now have that year of seasoning And going into this year, that helped them when they made appearances in weekends like this past one against Florida. But that team last year, probably if the pitching stayed a little bit more healthy, I think they were a regional bound team. And then they diverged because they just didn't have the arms at the end of the season. This team can take a path that's maybe on a more upward trajectory, which is, all right, we struggled at the beginning of the season to find some of our depth 
and guys like Logan Lunsford, who was a true freshman last season and performed admirably, now has his sophomore campaign and had to figure some things out, I think, and tweak some things in his outings at the start of the year. But now you see a team that's on the ascendancy. And if you can keep that going, especially this weekend against against a very good Georgia team, you can find, you know, that success builds upon success sequentially. On the other hand, if you have an offense that goes back into a bit of a slump as it did the first few league weekends, well, then you're going to find it very difficult. The SEC is more about hitting than it is about pitching, especially on some of these getaway days across the league. And if you don't have at least a little bit of offense to compete, you're going to struggle. The Tigers need to cut down their strikeouts. They need to find men on the base paths. And when they do that, they generally have a lot of success. When they struggle to do that, we've seen them struggle in the early season. So finding that next step for this team, I think can distinguish it from last year's uh, team that went through that Tennessee series early in the season in that they might be getting healthier. They might be on the rise from the pitching standpoint. And if the offense can continue to build, you see that happening instead of a team that just kept taking body blows with injury after injury a season ago. And you kind of mentioned it there. I mean, like the next step for this team is kind of staying a bit more consistent on offense, cutting down the strikeouts. We have seen a bit of inconsistency this season. I mean, you mentioned early in the season, it was kind of up and down. Uh, They had some tough non-con losses. Even this past Tuesday, I mean, they lost to SIUE after uh, they beat Florida. I mean, I I guess that's to be expected, obviously, under a first-year head coach that kind of had to just really get a whole ton of bodies in uh, very quickly. But, I mean, what has kind of been the, the thing keeping them from being a consistent like consistent team um, and what do they need to do to change that? It's an experience. It's the inexperience of this group playing games at the next level. I mean, when you have Drew Culbertson out there who starts as your everyday shortstop, then takes a little bit of time off when Matt Garcia comes back from an early season hand injury and then Culbertson's back in the fire and he's been the regular shortstop for the past couple of weeks. I mean, you're asking a freshman to do unfreshman like things. You don't have a chance to get yourself up to speed. You just have to be at speed. Otherwise, the team doesn't necessarily have success. And you can go up and down the roster with players like Brock Daniels, who is a transfer in and is in, in his third season in Division One baseball, but he didn't get a lot of time on this team last year. And he's come on on fire this past week or so, but didn't really get an opportunity early in the year. He's taking some of his first appearances You know, up and down the list, when you see those sorts of players, you think, okay, there are going to be mistakes. There will be so-called freshman mistakes, and there will be things that maybe they haven't encountered before at this level that, you know, make them run into trouble. Yeah, I've talked to a few of them, and what they seem to say is, you know, getting adjusted to the speed of the game is one of the things that you just have to do. It's one thing to be a standout on your high school team or even at the showcase level, in your um, club teams in high school when you are a star and your team can win because you do good things. Well, now you're playing against a bunch of people who were the stars on their high school team, right? And so taking your game to the next level and understanding what it takes for your game and your approach and your plan that day is something that's difficult to instill. And uh, there are players who have that consistency in phases in waves, whether they have their timing or their approach or whatever, then there are players who do it all the time. And the players who do that consistently all the time with the same approach and the same mindset, those are the ones that go on to play professional baseball somewhere. And learning that skill is not just something that most young players or players without experience at Division One are able to do on a game in, game out basis. The Tigers have shown flashes of that as a team, getting that consistency. And last weekend was a great example but can they keep it up? I mean, we saw in the midweek they dropped a game to a team that they certainly did not expect to in SIU Edwardsville. Probably taught them a lesson, right, about how any team on any day, despite how good you're feeling about yourself, can come in and get a victory if you don't play your best baseball. That's the sort of consistency we're talking about. And when they find their way to a more steady rhythm of that, they'll find their way to more success. I, I'm, I'm curious kind of along that front obviously you know especially with a younger team you know now you have you have Carrick Jackson Jackson coming in here as a new coach and and trying to establish you know not only consistency but some culture as well you've been with the team how have you seen you know Jackson kind of put his footprint on things and really try to make this you know his own kind of program different from Beezer because there's a mix of guys who you know were obviously there with him and and are now here with Jackson What have you seen kind of culture wise him establish that is bringing that team maybe uh, close to the consistency that that, you know, they need to reach? 
Well, the thing that he is trying to establish is a culture, and it's his team, and it's his culture, and that always takes a little bit of time, especially when there are some holdovers from previous seasons. But the motto of this team, I mean, if you've seen it on socials, Mizzou now with the hashtag, N-O-W stands for No Opportunity Wasted. And he wants his players to look at the games as opportunities in each at bat or each uh, appearance as an opportunity to show your skills and contribute to the team's success. You know, he's a big proponent of if you go into some of these palaces across FCC baseball and see that people have more or bigger than you, well, they don't have more feet or less feet between the base paths. It's still 60 feet, six inches from the pitching rubber to the plate. He wants to instill that mentality that if this team brings its best effort to the ballpark, game in and game out, it will be competitive. And he's also realistic in telling them, hey, you know, sometimes you're going to play your best and you will get beaten in this game. And that is something that he is willing to accept. I think that he is certainly an advocate of taking risks on the base paths and forcing the defense to make some plays. And we saw that to some success against the Florida Gators uh, over this past weekend. He's an advocate of if you make the aggressive mistake, that's not going to count against you. You know, play the game the right way. And sometimes that means you have to be aggressive and go ahead and take the risk. He wants players to play free, I think, like anybody else does. But he absolutely wants the mindset of if you do this the right way and do the little things, follow your game plan, prepare yourself mentally and physically for the game, and you can do this consistently, you can win in college baseball and in this league more often than not. And the coaching staff will put you in the best opportunity to do that. And I think that there is some buy-in there. I think the team realized after they got swept at Vanderbilt, that they were very close to seeing the results that they saw against Florida. They just didn't have the big moments go their way. And sticking to maybe more of their approach and their plan led them to more success. Now, can they do it again in another league weekend is going to be the test and the question that is to be answered for them now. But I think that that's the biggest part of the culture is finding your best every day and understanding that other people may have you know, the pomp and circumstance, but you've got a ball club too. And you're here for a reason to play division one baseball in the sec. You do your best. You'll come out a victor. Yeah. I, I like that. The, uh, the, the consistency and it's, you know, when you all take the base pass, doesn't matter who has the nicer stadium, the higher recruits, it's all, you know, zero, zero. You're all playing on the same, on the same service. I think that's a good, a good building block there. And that, yeah. that next test. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say that's absolutely right. And it's, it's, easy to say and it's hard to do especially right. for 18 to 22 23 year old guys yeah. you know it, it just it's human nature to begin with and the reason why pros are pros are a because a lot of them are freakishly talented and b the ones who aren't are able to do the same thing over and over and over that's why you see guys who aren't high draft picks that make it to the major leagues why do they do it because they found a way to hone their craft and they kept working at it it's like yeah. the cody schrader principle for bazoo football you can be a walk-on anywhere, and you can find yourself at the highest levels, and now he hopes to be drafted in the National Football League, and it's because he worked at it. And he, and he, knows, what his, he knows what his strengths are and his weaknesses are. He plays to his strengths, and he goes and attacks that game plan every day. And I think that that's a big part of what Carrick Jackson is trying to build. In the next test, talking about guys with pretty high statuses, um, you're facing a guy that could be the number one pick in July, and Charlie Condon entering today with 20 or er, entering this weekend series with 21 homers. I mean, what is what's kind of like the game plan for the Tigers against him and just against this Georgia team? Well, you saw a guy named Jack Heglione last weekend, and were able to get him to chase a little bit. I mean, he still had some long balls. He still produced for his team. Don't get me wrong. I feel like Georgia might be a little bit more consistent around Condon. I mean, you look at it, Corey Collins is no slouch either. And he's been playing a little bit longer, but he's a guy who's hit 37 home runs in his career. I, I could not believe this. I saw this in the Georgia game notes, and I'll read it off to you guys. Gordon Beckham has the home run lead at Georgia. And, and Gordon Beckham played a long time in the big leagues, very successfully, Chicago, L.A., all the rest. He had 53 home runs at Georgia between 2006 and 08, and he was gone in three years. Charlie Condon is a redshirt sophomore, started as a walk-on, he has 46 home runs in two seasons, 46 Jesus. home runs. So he's seven behind the best to ever hit home runs at the University of Georgia. And he is a guy who will take your mistake and absolutely dominate you. He obviously, I think he favors his home ballpark. There's a very short porch in right field that is conducive to all of these Georgia hitters. They're used to what they know. Left field is a bit deeper, but you can still get it out to the alleys. 
and center field isn't really that deep. I think that sometimes it, it actually plays a little bit like a hitter's ballpark, and they're a very confident team here. You know, Missouri will have to get the same sort of starting pitching that it's had. I don't think they can go into their bullpen with extreme depth and expect a lot of success unless the offense is really clicking. You know, look for guys like Javen Pimentel and um, Carter Rustad and uh, Logan Lunsford over the course of this weekend to get action and hopefully give you four or five good innings of action. And I think as well that Missouri offense needs to be aggressive. You know, Florida's pitching, especially, or Georgia's pitching rather, especially in the league, it hasn't necessarily set the world on fire. Their pitching overall looks about the same as Missouri's, but in league play, they've gotten roughed up a few times. And so can you take advantage of the mistakes that you will get from the Georgia staff and use that to your advantage? It doesn't always have to be with a long ball. Missouri won swept a series last weekend without hitting a home run. But it does have to be on base, then get your traffic, steal bases, put pressure on the defense, and start to get deep into that Georgia pen where no team wants to go. No team wants to go deep in their bullpen on an SEC weekend. They want the pitching plan to go impeccably. But the more you can force another team to see more and more of their arms, the better your chances are, especially the deeper you get in these series. I think Missouri's plan has to be a little bit of that, to try to be aggressive while also not giving away at bats and trying to do things they're not capable. And I wanted I wanted to kind of touch on that. You mentioned Pimentel, Lunsford, uh, Rustad. I mean, those guys. I mean, lately have been much much better. I mean, L- Lunsford especially. He like you mentioned earlier, he kind of had to to readjust after the start of the year, but he's been much better lately. Um, Pimentel has been great this year. Rustad's been good. Um, what have you thought of Missouri's uh, starting pitching? Um, and what they can maybe even improve on? Well, I I think that it certainly has come around. And in league play, um, the starters have performed very capably against some good offenses, whether it's Florida, Vanderbilt before them. I mean, uh, Pimentel went out and went, you know, hitless through four and a half, something like that, against uh, the Arkansas Razorbacks. And they're a very good team. So I think that You know, there is certainly ability to improve always, but I think the guys who have kind of settled in as the weekend rotation in some form or fashion, um, with Rustad kind of being a wild card from a time or two, because sometimes they're holding him out to see if they can get a win early in the series, and he came in in relief and did that against Florida. Uh, Those three are kind of the keystones, and they've all improved their game over the season. I mean, Rustad, that changeup is just dominant. It can be a big league changeup for him if he keeps working on it and figures out how to locate it maybe with a little bit more consistency. Pimentel has just been better, it seems like, every time he's gone out, and he's consistent, he's loose all the time. I think he's a good influence on his teammates and how he approaches the game of baseball, confident but still you know, relaxed, and he doesn't get too tense about it. And Lunsford's really changed his game. He was not locating across the plate very well early in the season, and he would miss with some fastballs up, and teams were hitting the home run off him. And he really has worked on locating that pitch to either side of the plate and then also spotting his curveball, which last week against Florida, he and Carrick Jackson were both very um, forthcoming in saying that a lot of SEC hitters don't see an over-the-top curveball at as slow as 69 miles an hour. They see these power sliders again and again and again, and they just find it hard to adjust to someone who can throw a slow curve in as the change of pace. And so that makes you know a top end of 91, 92 on a given day from Lunsford look like it's 95, 96 when you're locating that pitch and mixing up a changeup with it. Yeah. I just feel like the pitchers, as they've worked with Tim Jamison, have all improved throughout the course of the season generally. We've seen them, I think, hone in their command, and this goes for the bullpen too. And now the question is going to be, okay, so you're working on these skills. You're trying to improve them. Now can you take them against the best of the best and have success? And uh, the only way to answer that question is to play these games. Yeah, and the, the you know, see how the consistency, like you said, kind of improves with some of the – the things the pitching has to offer. Uh, Matt, I have, a, I have a fun question. I'm switching the vibe a little mm-hmm. bit for you. Um, I want to ask you about one guy on this roster, and I'm glad I can do this before I you know, got too old. Um, it's Jackson Lovich. Now, uh, the three of us, Kenny Payton and I, we graduated uh, in May of 23. I took a class with Jackson Lovich, so I don't. maybe this will be a good nugget for you uh, to have. It was an acting for non-majors class. So, you know, we had to do sort of acting and performances. He was a pretty energetic guy, pretty fun, always kind of, you know, dove all into it. Didn't didn't like really slack off. Like he he, he enjoyed the he seemed to enjoy the class. I'm wondering mm-hmm. someone who sees him every day, sees him play. What's his energy like on the field? And uh, I don't know, is he 
does he seem like in your vibe that he could make a make for a good actor? I don't know. He was just a he was he was a steady presence in that class. You said acting for non majors, and I was like, yeah, that sounds like Lovich. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. I mean, he, he didn't take that just to blow it off. He, he is an energetic no, no. guy. He's always got a he's always got a smile around the ball club. I think that he goes about his business um, seriously. I think that he you know he's still working on his craft as a hitter and his approach, but his talents are undeniable. I mean, there is a reason why he and his brother Ross, uh, until Ross decided to transfer to Arkansas this season, I mean, you could see the foundation of any team being very solid with those two players. And the Jackson, I think, doesn't get too high or too low about himself and his play. I think he's very determined to want to be a force on this team. And the way he's going to do that is by handling his business the right way and not getting you know, too excited about feeling that I'm in the middle of this lineup and I have to be the one to deliver the big one. You know, he's got pretty good plate discipline. I think in the field, although he's not played the field for a little while due to a thumb injury, I think in the field, he's a very capable hand at first base. And I think he's grown in that regard very well over the off season into this year. And um, I think he definitely is someone that his teammates can look up to and say, Hey, here's a guy who's going out there and who's performing more often than not in the right way. Maybe I can follow that if only by example. And I see Jackson Lovich as someone who can be really important to what this team does, not just the rest of this season, but down the road too. That's a, that's good to hear. Cause he, that, and and that's one that's interesting to hear that he's, you know, already kind of a leader. Cause he still seems, I, I think he's pretty young still him himself. So that's good to hear. And uh, he's, he's a nice kid. I'll be rooting for him. If you want a nugget, he did a, he did a monologue in that class from an old Batman cartoon with another kid. Uh, so that was, <laughs> he did wear a Cape, I believe. Uh, if, I, if I remember right. I so. wouldn't expect him to not wear a cape. I mean, if Lovitz <laughs> is going to go out and do something, he'll go ahead and just do it full bore. He's not going to be, he's not going to shy away from showing off like that. So I uh, don't oh, no, He was I, all in. Now he might have to be called the Cape Crusader. We'll see. There you go. <laughs> uh, you mentioned Tim Jamison earlier. Um, you were a Mizzou grad just like us in 2009. Tim Jamison coming back to this program. I mean, was it any surprise? Was it just a full circle moment for you? Well, um, I, I don't think when it came back, it was a complete surprise. I don't think it's something that Coach James had ever expected. You know, I mean, you go off and you decide to get back into the coaching game after, you know, he spent some time around Missouri after um, he was relieved of his duties as head coach. And, you know, he, he still coached. He helped with the softball team. He was around the ballpark. I mean, he still very much loves Missouri. And it's a family affair. It goes on through his dad. I mean, they've been a long time Columbia residents and loved the University of Missouri. And I think his opportunity to get back with Carrick Jackson when he asked him, hey, come be my pitching coach. I've got this job at Memphis was something that he took as a true opportunity to give back, I think, to Carrick. I know one thing when I first saw Coach Jay after, you know, he got the job and it was official. He said, you know, I'm I'm just so glad to be coaching pitching again. It's not that he didn't want to be the head coach necessarily anymore for, you know, the way that that goes, but there's a bunch of other stuff that goes into that. I mean, whether the team does good or bad, you're the one facing the music. You're making decisions on all sorts of little things throughout the day. In the end, the buck stops with you and you can take all that stuff and get away from sometimes what you really enjoy doing. And I think what Coach Jay really enjoys doing is working with pitchers, molding them and turning them into very, very quality arms. And we've seen it throughout history, right? You, you only need to mention the likes of Gibson, Scherzer and Crow to understand the level of pitcher that Jim Jamison has brought into the University of Missouri and worked with. I think he's been a really good influence on this staff. I think that pretty much everybody has accepted the fact that, hey, this guy's got a wealth of knowledge and he can really help you go about this business. Um, probably a little bit different voice for some players is, again, something to get used to, but I don't think it's been in a bad way for any of them. And I think the results are showing on the field in terms of league play about what they're really capable of doing. And he's just someone who instills confidence all the time. And, you know, I think he's really taking it in stride. He he doesn't assert himself as like, hey, I was here once and I did it this way. If Carrick Jackson wants counsel from Tim Jamison, he'll certainly offer it. But he's he's not going to be a voice that stands out and says, well, back when I did it. No, this is Carrick Jackson's team, and Tim Jamison is a vital part of it. And I think the way that things have gone have really worked well for all parties involved, even though it's a, it's a reunion that nobody would have expected you know, a couple of years ago. It's a reunion that I think is, is working out, and hopefully for the long term and for the better. And just one last question for me. Um, just wanted to go back to some of the transfers because we mentioned them a little bit. Um, 
Kedier Hernandez, I mean, he's been, I think he's probably been all Missouri could have asked for. I mean, obviously when they brought him in, he was kind of renowned for his defense, uh, but he's also been pretty stable uh, at the plate as well, especially in the Florida series. Uh, Jarrett Curtis, uh, he's been a pretty consistent, uh, he's consistently penciled into the lineup. I'm just curious what your thoughts on what this transfer uh, class has been and um, how you think they grade out for Carrick's squad. Well, they're going to be an important part, and they've been an important part of Missouri's team really for the last few seasons. Ever since you've seen the portal open up, you've seen transfers in all the time and transfers out too. It's the name of the game. I I say that you kind of have no excuse as a player anymore to not play where you want to be. And I think that that's a benefit for a place like Missouri because, I mean, you can always try to have in the back of your head is human nature. Well, if the grass is greener somewhere else, why don't I try this? But everybody who's a transfer in, I always ask them, you know, why did you choose Missouri? And they universally seem to say, well, I enjoy the coaching staff. I think that's first and foremost. And the second thing is, you know, the opportunity to play in the Southeastern Conference against the best of the best is something I, I really take to heart. And, you know, take a guy like Hernandez who basically has come out and said, you know, I I was hitting my ceiling in the Big East. And even though it was close to home and he's a native of Trenton, New Jersey, and playing at Seton Hall is comfortable, he didn't want to be comfortable anymore. He wanted to grow his game. And I think he's done that. I think he's a very good defensive catcher. I think he's one of the better defensive catchers in the Southeastern Conference. And I think that his confidence and his attitude, he's another guy who always has a smile on his face, approaches the game positively, but approaches his role in it in a serious matter and is always trying to study and learn. I think he's a model player for what Carrick Jackson would like to have happen at the university of Missouri and how he'd like his team to develop. He has been a revelation. I think that Jared Curtis has needed some time to get adjusted to sec gameplay. He didn't get a lot of time at Texas tech, but you see the talent. He has those moments off his bat where it just jumps and he can jump right on the base paths. It seems with the best of them. He needs to learn how to maybe get on base a little bit more with that speed. But when he's on base, he absolutely can fly. And, you know, even even players like Ryan Magdish, and it's an interesting story, Magdish, is because here's a guy who went to junior college in a couple of different places, then went to Division II. He was playing in the state of Florida Division II baseball last year. And uh, somewhere around the coaching horn, uh, Mizzou staff gets a hold of, hey, this guy has a bit of an arm, but he hasn't pitched. He was a position player for the last couple of seasons at the lower levels. Um, you want to take a shot on him. They hear about him. They do their due diligence. They say, well, as far as we know, he's a good guy. Let's bring him in and let's bring him into pitch. And what he's done is go out there and maybe not, you know, three times a week, but when he's called upon, be one of the better arms this team has. He can get it up there to 95 miles per hour. He's got a great attitude, taking his graduate classes. And he's jumped from, again, Division II to the SEC and been a very capable piece. And oh, by the way, he came into school at semester. So in fall ball, he wasn't here. He came on in January and became, you know, someone who is still growing his craft, but could be an integral piece to this team. You know, if you want to judge based upon everybody who's come in from different places, you know, I think the grade, if you want to have it that way, Pete, is still undefined to some degree because we've got a lot of season left to play. But in terms of the impacts that most of these guys have been able to have on the team, they've been necessary impacts. And they're slowly, I think, realizing, and Hernandez may be the best example, of just how to impact and fit into this club to make the most of your opportunity. And I think as we see these next couple of weeks, especially go on, it'll be very interesting to find out how many more of them are able to embrace that role and take it and run with it. Because if you can, I mean, all of a sudden you've got a ball club that's going to be competing to make Hoover and to maybe spoil some other people's uh, seasons in this league. Yeah. Some, some fun stories. There's just some, some, you know, some good guys with some, you know, some good origin stories here on this team kind of coming together, trying to gel in this, you know, culture as Carrick get this team established. Um, you can hear Matt Michaels uh, calling Mizzou baseball games here for the rest of the season. Matt, I'll, I'll end. I want to end on this one. Um, I, I like to ask anyone I talk to in commentary this. Uh, your favorite moment, whether it's Mizzou or otherwise, that you've uh, called in your career so far. Hopefully there are many more to come. But uh, if you I don't know if you have pinpoint on one or. Hmm. Or uh, yeah, a moment you you were really uh, enjoyed covering. A moment that I was on the call. Well, I gotta say, sweeping Florida is pretty high up the list. To be honest with you, <laughs> you the go. Tigers had never done that. The Tigers for a long time had not even had a win against Florida. I mean, 
I saw a lot of games against the Florida Gators where Missouri wasn't on the upside. And, you know, we try to do a good job, win or lose, Tex Little and myself, and making the broadcast entertaining. But it's tough to keep telling the same story. And we had a different story to tell with those three one-run wins. So I think that was memorable, the way they came back in that ninth inning. That's one I'll definitely never forget. I think that um, Luke Mann last season performing at South Carolina, three home runs, albeit in a loss. It was an extra inning loss, but I'll never forget that game, just the way that he showed out and really performed capably. Um, I think I'll remember, too, uh, the game against Oklahoma that Missouri played at Minute Maid Park uh, during the pandemic season in 2020 was a big comeback win. And I'll never, ever forget that, um, I believe it was Clayton Peterson, one of the Peterson brothers from Oklahoma, showed a uh, bunt, pulled it back, and hit a slash home run into the Crawford boxes. And I don't think I'll ever see anything like that again. So it's it's moments like that that kind of stand out when it comes to uh, success or things that you're on the call and you really remember. But, you know, when you go back and I look back at some box scores sometimes, I go like, oh, yeah, it was that game. You know, and you do it for a while, you just kind of – catch up and there's so many of them you get there but i think that those are some of the ones in recent memory that stand out to me yeah it burns burns in the burns in the brain after a while just the you can look at the you can look at the one box score and you remember where you were or how you were feeling what the call was that's awesome um that was I, a game where so and so did that yep 100%. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> i gotta jump in here i gotta ask one thing we're friends with peter zimmerman we've talked to him a handful of times now i mean did did you like talk with pete a lot i mean did, how did you like him as a person Pete's a great guy. You know, he hit that walk-off double against Oklahoma to win that game that I was talking about at Minute Maid Park. And, yeah. you know, I, I think that I think that Peter has been outspoken in his love for Mizzou baseball in his career after uh, playing the game here. And, and I think he wants nothing more than for the Tigers to have success. Um, maybe the only thing he wants more is for the Blues to have success. But other than that, I mean, he's he's a guy who's a, a true son in every sense of the word. And even though, you know, it it found a minute for him to get on the field and really have his success. He, he's shown, and you know, he's one of those examples. I think of players who just, you know, a pandemic came in and wiped out, you know, a lot of positive momentum. And even though that team couldn't have gone to the postseason due to the NCAA, which is a whole other story for a whole other time. Um, I think that I I look back at Peter Zimmerman's time really fondly, and as a guy who, you know, as long as he wants to keep playing, I hope there's someone who wants to give him the opportunity because he's a baseball player that you don't want to uh, overlook and a really good leader and, and a good person. Yeah. He's a great guy. We, we, we love Pete. It's, it's, it, it's been fun when we can have him on um, Matt. Thank you so much. This was awesome. We'll have you back on here in Hoover. Let's, let's see if Tigers can get there. We'll, we'll have you come on for a, for a preview. Yeah. That sounds like the plan. Thank you very much for having me guys. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks Matt. <laughs> Okay, quick hits time. Thank you to Matt. I really hope he mentions the Jackson Lovich uh, acting thing on the air. I will feel very accomplished if I got some sort of influence on the on the baseball commentary. Um, quick hits, Jersey of the Week. Kenny, take it away. Uh, my Jersey of the Week goes to Big Jordan Wilmore. Uh, mm -hmm. This graphic comes from NCAA buzzer beaters and game winners, and it's all players above seven foot three in D1 basketball in the 2023-2024 season. And there's two Mizzou guys on here. Connor Vanover, of course, at seven foot five, and Jordan Wilmore in the seven foot three category. This is pretty cool, kind of just showing, you know, Zach Eady isn't just tall. You know, he's playing well for his size is what this guy's angle was. Um, my favorite part about this is that someone made a second graphic of the weights of each player to kind of show you like the size, the actual size of them and not just their height. And Jordan Wilmore got IDK over him while all the other players got their official weights. And I thought this was amazing that they just said IDK and then NCAA buzzer beaters, of course, replied. He weighs 356 pounds, by the way. There's also yeah. another Mizzou legend on here in um, Jamarian Sharp, top left there. Only yeah. Um, former future, former future Missouri Tiger. Yeah, so very well represented. If you look at uh, Connor Vanover's stats, they actually stack up pretty well. Um, to so, Edie? Yeah. To, well, no, to everyone else on the graphic, <laughs> um, as you can see. But, um, yeah, it was a neat little graphic. Uh, Jordan Wilmore mentioned. Um, always a good thing. 22% of the nine players on here played for Mizzou at one point in their careers. We love our tall, our tall dons. Weren't they, aren't they, weren't they the only team in the country with three seven footers? 
this last year? I think year? that was like a stat I heard. Yeah, oh, that was a stat I kept hearing. And I don't think they were any good. Moving on. No, they weren't. Tall. Peyton, Jersey. Jersey of the week. Mine is going to be Kiki Chisholm of Armed Forces Bowl uh, 2021 fame. Uh, he, he's, uh, he's playing for the Houston Roughnecks right now, Kenny, in the UFL. Um, Kiki makes, uh, as you can see, if you're watching on the YouTube, if you're um, on the podcast form, I'll explain it as best I can. Kiki Chisholm is running down the sideline. He calls he for the ball. It. He makes a very, they, they call this a leaping grab. He like leaps two inches in the air. It's really not much of a it's kind of just a badly thrown pass. I think yeah, it's leaping touchdown because he leaped to the end zone. Oh, did he? I don't know. I stopped watching. Um, Kiki Chisholm uh, one time made a leaping touchdown in Texas. Uh, to put Mizzou in the lead of the 2021 Armed Forces Bowl. Unfortunately, Mizzou lost that game, though. Yeah. Kiki, do you love me? Great reply. That's No one's ever said that before. Right. Um, yeah, he was good. Has the, has the UFL been good? I have not, I have not, I have watched not seen before. anything. No, All right. <laughs> bad question to ask, I guess. Um, yeah, that was a bad, badly thrown pass, but the juke was very nasty. So shout out, shout out Kiki Chisholm. Um, my Jersey of the week, I'm going to the NBA. I did not do a uh, Mizzou one, but I just thought this was kind of cool. Um, I'm going with Pat Spencer. Who's Pat Spencer? You might ask. Well, if you're a Golden State Warriors fan, you probably know who he is. He plays for the Golden State Warriors. Um, here's his career leading up to playing for the Golden State Warriors, the NBA team, by the way. Um, Pat Spencer played college lacrosse. Um, he was the, I guess, this says best collegiate lacrosse player of all time at Loyola, Maryland. I don't know what the qualifier for that is, um, but he played college lacrosse. Then as a grad transfer, went to Northwestern, um, started 29 games there, went to the G League, and is now on a two-way deal with the Golden State Warriors. So two-sport athlete. I just don't think you see that that much where you play college lacrosse and then you end up uh, playing in the NBA. So pretty cool. I really? Think- because I've always heard the best path to the NBA is to play college <laughs> Oh, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Wait, we're seeing that more now. There was the Alabama quarterback who transferred to Notre Dame to play lacrosse. So I guess that's switching to lacrosse from another sport. But uh, yeah, I don't know how often you see this. I think my favorite reply when this first came out was just someone said, like, why didn't he just play pro lacrosse? It's like, (laughs) I don't think you're making as much money there, man, as as a (laughs) D-League or NBA contract. So I had a loyal... I had a loyal Maryland sticker on my computer in high school. Of course you did. Yeah. Why do you have a loyal? Why? Because they came to visit and they told me it was a very good journalism school and you could work for Under Armour, as you see in this photo if you're watching on the YouTube. Under Armour is from Maryland and Loyola Maryland has some like tie for internships. And so I put the sticker on my computer and it was like an L. Yeah. It wasn't. Yeah, well, it's a green. Yeah, it's a green L, isn't it? Green L. It is. Yeah. Go oh, Greyhounds. Yeah, shout out, shout out, uh, Pat Spencer. Way to make it in the NBA. I'm. We're gonna have to talk NBA playoffs on the show soon, and I, I can't. Yeah, it's in nine days. Right? Yeah, yeah. All right, next segment, Sean. I like no cap, and he's the main bird. No, I like no cap, and he's the main bird. No, I like no cap. Stop it, Johnny. Too, too much. Too much. Uh, I, saw him, I saw him at the Final Four, by the way, the Reese's All American game. Uh, it was. Yeah, we no talked game. about it. Don't worry. That was a nice little homecoming. Oh, yeah. Spoiler. I didn't. I guess I didn't listen. Sorry. What's your main bird, Kenny? Uh, my main bird is Adam Silver. Uh, you might think, oh, is it Jonte Porter? Why does he have you know some tie to a bird? Yeah, I couldn't find one. So Adam Silver, University of Chicago grad. Phil the Phoenix is the mascot. He also calls what Jonte Porter did, what Jonte Porter's accused of, a cardinal <laughs> sin. And that's a bird. And that cardinal punishment... Sin. For, uh, he could be banished from the league if all of the accusations are true. Ooh, banished. Yeah, the the, the word, use of the word banished, like not banned, not like, you know, any other, I don't know, any other synonym for banned, banished. It's like he's getting kicked out. He can't set foot in a gym ever again. If he goes to an NBA game, he will be arrested on site. Yeah, this is, this is bad. Um, I think we should bring up the idea. Shout out a friend of the show, Chase Madison. There needs to be a 30 for 30 made on the Porter family at some point. Uh, I don't, no. I don't know if we need to give them any more attention. <laughs> I, 
the whole podcast thing this past week, Peyton and I were playing Xbox last night and talking oh, about who God. MPJ was talking to on his podcast. I don't want to talk about who it was. You can look it up yourself just because it was it Lana is- Rhodes. But, uh, man, it was it was just a terrible, convers- was. terrible conversation. And the, the, the clips that came from it, I was so uncomfortable watching. it. I had to pause it every, like, 10 seconds. I just was getting secondhand embarrassment from watching That's- Michael it's- Porter Jr. talk it's- to her. That's a bullseye, Kenny. Like it's just like you watch some of that, and it's just like you cringe up. Like, like what are you doing? Like, go go play basketball. Go go prepare. Go do anything else. Play video games. Why are you talking about this stuff? It was just so yeah. uncomfortable. It's M I Z. Yeah, true son. Yay. <laughs> that it, it's kind of the same thing where it's like you know how a lot of old head NBA players say like, oh, people like Stephen A. Smith should be talking about basketball because they didn't like play professionally. It's like mm. I feel like some basketball players should not appear on just like life podcasts when they it's like well it's his don't podcast. have much they don't is have it, much good things to say. Is it his podcast? I think it's Michael Porter. Jr. Yeah, he was the one asking oh. questions. Oh boy, maybe we should just there's just so much through. he could do with his life. He could go get a smoothie in downtown Columbia. All right, there's yeah. just oh, so much more he could go do. To go to his dentist orthodontist near yeah. orthodontist. Yeah, near uh, uh, Rockbridge High School. Maybe we should have him come guest host this podcast. Just see what happens. See if we'd be allowed. I'd love to have him as a guest host. Yeah, he can come on anytime. That's an open invite. Any Porter family member they're not on. Uh, Peyton, what's your main bird? Uh, my main bird, and it's really more of a dirty bird, um, but we have to talk about this, unfortunately. John Calipari, who, of course, is most known for, as Anthony Christensen said, uh, who you also see the tweet there, um, was a pit assistant, but he was also a UNC Wilmington player. Uh, there, of course, the Seahawks. He is the new Arkansas uh, men's basketball coach. Um, this is the most surreal, unbelievable things I think I have ever seen in a. Co- I've seen a lot of crazy garbage in coaching carousels. This might take the cake i mean john calipari just being so fed up at kentucky he just went to arkansas is just unbelievable to me i mean i'm not gonna sugarcoat it it totally i uh i if you have watched this show enough you know i'm not quite very i'm not quite fond of arkansas and this really uh really sucks to see um, they're going to probably be very good under him. Okay, I can't keep watching this. I'm sorry, I gotta pause it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's the terrible. same thing with the Michael Porter podcast. Yeah, <laughs> it's too hard. Mascot just running through. Like I just, it's horrible. Yeah. It's a horrible sight. Um, good for Arkansas, man. I don't know what to say. Well, and now, like, I mean, I'm I've gone back and forth, Peyton, because I I want to buy the Cal is washed. The game's passed him by. He hasn't won the tournament forever. Exactly. That's not going to change the, you know, even with this cycle, all of the guys Cal got to Kentucky that are now going to all flip to Arkansas and all the five stars. He's going to just parade through Fayetteville. It's just going to suck. It's going to be hell when those graphics get made. It's going to be hell when those kids all go to Arkansas, whether or not it like, like, you know, I I still don't think you can win with just freshmen, but they're going to throw Adam. I think we should boycott Tyson Foods. I think we should all not eat Tyson Foods for the rest of our lives. I am not getting Tyson chicken nuggets anymore. Okay. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're the cause of this. I will never get Tyson chicken nuggets from Walmart ever again. Well done, Peyton. Fighting the good fight. Sad. Uh, also, Kentucky doesn't have a coach because Scott Drew is going to come there and we're recording this on Thursday and he said he's staying at Baylor. So I don't Scott know what they're going to do either. Never leaving Baylor, like that is not. He's never leaving Baylor. Does God told him to stay. <laughs> God did, but who's Kentucky going to hire? They're going to have Bruce Dennis Pearl. Gates. That's my prediction. Dennis Gates. Uh, yeah, no, but yeah, this sucks. It's a. I don't know. At least Mizzou got the two, the top guy in Arkansas this year, because I don't know how much they're going to be doing that ever again. So. Caden yeah. Quintance and Razorback Red Dog. I mean, what a disaster. Yeah, Seriously. Not fun. not fun. Um, my Shawnee's main bird of the week is going to uh our good friend of the program and the uh 
not host of Power Mizzou. What am I trying? Admin for Power Mizzou. Um, Gabe DeArmond. Of course, he's he's been on this program before. I don't have a bird connection off the top of my head. I just wanted to talk about this. Uh, he was he was posting stuff and just on Twitter all day talking about uh, he was asked who he would pick for Mizzou's mascot if if he got to change it based on like a state name. And Gabe just was all in on this argument. I thought it was just funny. Um, he had a long answer. You can read it on the screen on Twitter. Uh, my favorite at the end was the connection to tornadoes, like the Mizzou, like twisters or something like that. I think I think that would have been my pick from all the ones I saw. But what would you guys what would you guys rename Mizzou if they were uh, if you got to decide the name the team contest or whatever? The Dennis Gates Brady Cooks. That's I'd have to think opinion. about it to be honest with you. Um, what what I mean, what's like Missouri known for? Like, well, that's I, what he says. So he says if you could start over, they talk about the Oregon Trail. So you'd right. be the explorers or the frontiersmen or the pioneers. That uh, makes sense. There was something about scroll scroll down, Kenny. I think there was maybe the trailblazers. Too. Yeah, yeah. The the catfish. I don't know. Wait, where does waffle yeah, cones come from? I have no idea. That's bad. That's, that's bad. That the weak warm. Like you'd have copyright issues with UCM. the mules would be awesome. The mules. <laughs> There's UCM mules, like literally less than an hour away. Make them change it. <laughs> Jim Crane went there. You know this. I don't hate the like storm or the tornadoes. I, I think. What about so the like, showbies? Cool. The showbies. No, the, showbies. the showers. <laughs> like the volunteers. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> The Billikens? Uh, the, <laughs> the Cupies. 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 The Bruins. There we go. Yeah. The Zoo Bruins. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I just thought this was a fun debate. I, it, I like. I was tempted to text Gabe and just be like, was it slow news day this week? No, <laughs> no AD news is what we're talking Someone, we're someone did like reply like, this is dumb. And he was like, can I not have fun? And it's just like, <laughs> that's just like, like <laughs> I was just like, what, what are you Poor talking Gabe. about, Gabe? Like, like sometimes like you'll, you'll bash someone, but. I mean, this is fun for you to have a little fun, I guess, during this. <laughs> that was part why I didn't text year. him. He, he, I, yeah. I, I feel like I wanted to cut him a break because there was definitely people on the message board just being like, "What the hell? Can we just have recruiting news, man?" Gabe just wants to have a, you know, let, let Gabe have a let him have fun. Day. Yeah, let him have fun. Uh, Mizzou tornadoes. That would be my vote. Um, all right, <laughs> best things you learned, Peyton. What did you uh, learn this week? Best thing I learned this week, Ms., uh, Missouri, well represented at um, the Chiefs' local pro day. Uh, this was a couple days ago, so this was on the two on the on the ninth. Uh, Wendell Shepard had a full list of it. Uh, Wendell Shepard, of course, who we've mentioned a million times. I mean, he's been on the show. Uh, did great work uh, for the Columbia Missourian on the beat. Uh, Missouri guy, guys had a surprise um, representative there, but they also had Jalon Carleys, of course, Xavier Delgado, Javon Foster, Niles Gaddy. Tyron Hopper, Marcellus Johnson, Nate Pete, Cody Schrader, and a defensive tackle slash tight end in Zach Elam from the wrestling team. Of course, Zach Elam, a very accomplished member of the Missouri wrestling team. He was trying out as a defensive tackle and a tight end, so that's very interesting. That would be very cool to see if he could uh, maybe latch on somewhere like that. Um, yeah, I, nothing like crazy, but... It was just a cool thing I learned. I, I think I saw the uh, the Vikings. What did they tweet about? I'm not familiar with WWE, but they tweeted the one of the WWE wrestlers, and it was like we knew first. I did not see. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, never mind. Yeah, it was uh, uh, Roman Reigns. It was a picture yeah, yeah. of Roman Reigns. Oh, they, they, oh, 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 oh! You're okay. Yeah, I see what you mean. They, they tweeted that photo. I want the Chiefs to tweet out a photo of Zach Elam when he goes pro in wrestling. Yeah, there's the Roman Reigns photo. Oh, there's Roman um, Reigns. We acknowledge I the tragedy first. Very good. I want the Chiefs to do that with uh, with Zach Elam. Maybe he goes, I don't know, to WWE or pro wrestling or does something. And he, But he made the Chiefs roster. That'd be sick. But yeah, yeah shout, out, uh, cool. shout out the pro day. That's that's yeah, fun. Released him first. <laughs> Damn. Uh, Kenny, what did you learn? I just want to give another shout out to the Chiefs. I mean, they've gone out of the ordinary to sign players before. Uh, oh, they yeah. signed a, a rugby star, Luis Reese Zamit, uh, in March. So, hey, anything can happen in this sport. And the, the Chiefs, uh, maybe they're, they're one of those uh, teams now that they'll find talent like the Patriots used to do and just um, 
turn athletes into football players. Uh, best Brandon thing Aubrey, I'm... who was the kicker for the Cowboys, played soccer. He was really good for like half the season. How much? Wait, I have a question. How much would you guys have to get paid uh, to like hop into a like the highest level rugby game, like the rugby sevens, and like have to play millions? I'm, I would, like, I would be broken in half. Fifteen yeah. bucks? That'd be awesome. Okay. I'd love to get in, there, get in a rugby scrum. You're insane. Yeah. And, all right. I guess we'll be finding a new co-host after that happens because Peyton will be crippled. No, uh, yeah. because this is actually a hypothetical scenario, not a real one. No one would ever offer me to play rugby, Jack. Okay. What'd you learn, Kenny? Best thing I learned this week is that the Cotton Bowl had its own bracket challenge. And <laughs> unfortunately, the Mizzou Tigers did not win at all. Uh, falling short in the championship to Tulane versus USC, the 2023 game Damn. versus the 2024 game. Of course, we were at the 2024 game. My favorite part about this graph, and if you're watching on the YouTube, you can see this. Uh, first round was Mizzou and Ohio State versus the 2015 game of Michigan State and Baylor. On the other side of the bracket, it was Tulane versus USC. You, If you're not watching watching what we're looking at right now, you would not guess what the other game is that they put on here. And it's the 1957 <laughs> cotton bowl versus TCU or TCU versus Syracuse. Uh, unbelievable. This is a hilarious I, graphic to me. I love that that game made it on there. Yeah. I don't know how that one made it all the way. I will say though, Kenny, it was a full on bracket. Like I was, it did all 64. I don't know really before, but it was more than just four. Like they, oh they had a whole, Oh yeah, there you go. Oh, there's the full one. Yeah. Okay, that's a lot. I don't of know games. how 1957 Ooh. made it that far, but okay. That also begs the question for me. Like, okay, I'm obviously that was an awesome game for us to be at Mizzou Ohio State. That game was not that fun objectively to watch. It was a super low scoring game. There's defense. How did that game make it that far? Like, I think I it's know. because Mizzou, there's a lot of Mizzou thing. fans on Twitter, and that's Mizzou fans flooded the holes. The holes, yeah. Okay, well, the good way to go, Mizzou fans. But yeah, that's also even weirder that the 1957 game. <laughs> Clearly, no one loved Penn State versus Memphis. They said they said we'd rather go back to black and white TV before we before we push that game through. That's so funny. Do we know this game was on TV? That's my question. <laughs> probably not. Yeah, it probably was. <laughs> Kenny, you're a Syracuse fan. You don't remember the quarterback from that yeah, game? Yeah, take me back. It was a great game. You also the 1957 see, Syracuse roster. Mizzou, Oklahoma State was a 16, and they beat the number one overall seed in Notre Dame. Boom. So, there you go. How do you like? How do you like that? Uh, Notre Dame. The Orange Men. They weren't even the Orange. They were the Orange Men. They only played. I surprised it lasted that long. I thought it ended in like the 40s that they stopped calling themselves that. Mm -hmm. Five, three, and one. Ninth year head coach Ben. Oh, this is the wrong team. Schwartz, Schwartzman Ryder. There, you, there go. you go. Oh, they lost. They didn't beat TCU. That's unfortunate. Look at that stacked. Uh, what? Look at that stacked independence. Miami, in Navy, round. Syracuse, all ranked. Pittsburgh's in there. Elite Navy, you should have a proper program. Let me tell you. Yeah. Oh, Jim Brown. There you go. They couldn't win. It's disappointing. It's disappointing. Jeez, who is um, that? Stinks. Shout out. Uh, my, be my best thing I learned this week. I'm going away. We're going away from sports for a minute. Um, the Eclipse. This is just a random uh, news guys tweet that I found about it. But um, the solar eclipse happened, guys. Did you guys watch the eclipse? I wasn't I that see it. it was cloudy here. Yeah. Oh. I didn't get to see it. It was sunny where I was, but like it, I was in the northern Midwest and it like it didn't. Like when you looked up at the sun, which don't do that, but when you look up at the sun, it like didn't, I didn't see the actual moon come by, but like it was a weird, like if you looked out, it looked like dimmer, you know, like it looked like it was like a weird, like it should have been dusk, but it was still the middle of the day and the sun was still, I don't know, but I, in some places it looked pretty cool, but I don't know. I like space stuff. I'm not an eclipse guy. Like I was like, this is, this is a thing that's happening. There wasn't much aura with this eclipse, you know? Well, yeah. I didn't like the chakra, you know. I, I, I the 2017 eclipse had so much more vibes, I think. Do we need we need an eclipse bracket challenge? <laughs> Which eclipse like was the cappuccino best one? eclipse and 2017 was like a frappe 
eclipse. You know what I'm saying? Like there was just more chakra, Kavorka, if you know what I'm saying. Did you steal that from a? This sounds like you stole that from a TikTok. There's no way you know that off the top of your head. I just know what all those words mean. Yeah. All right. No aura. I don't know. This is a slow week, but shout out the eclipse. Um, also, I think, we do yeah. know the newsman that uh, who's no, who, I don't know who that is, but that's the, Chris Madison you roomed with them. I didn't know. I didn't know that. Like, <laughs> damn. I thought like. I thought this was one of those things. The way it was getting hyped was it was like it wasn't going to happen for another thousand years. It's going to happen in like twenty years again. Yeah, but I mean, like, it's still we, once every, like you see maybe four in your lifetime. Then if you're lucky, we every had two eclipse. We had eclipse like two years ago. Yeah, there was like one October. In cool one. Still happened. What's cool? I look at it and they look a the same. Full solar eclipse. I didn't see a full solar eclipse. This is Mickey Mouse. You weren't in the path of totality. That's why I wasn't. Yeah, well, that's maybe go... why I think 2017 was more of a vibe because I was in the path of totality. Uh, <laughs> All right, knock it off. All right, we're done. What? What's the joke? You got a joke? This pain? one comes uh, from our favorite TV series, The Today Show. Um... <laughs> Guys, what's the best air to breathe if you want to be rich? Um, money tree air. Any guesses, Kenny? No. Millionaire. <laughs> that checks. So good. That wouldn't even be yawn. I can't. I don't know. Hal wasn't cooking there. That was a vibe check one. You yeah. Know, Orca. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, thanks again to Matt. It was a good interview. If you skip past that for whatever reason, go back and listen to it because it was a good interview. Um, Thank you to Bet Online for sponsoring the show. We'll be back Monday. Hopefully, I'll have some more decor up and I won't look like I'm stuck in an interrogation room or something. Um, until then, everyone have a fun and safe weekend. Go enjoy yourselves. Uh, we'll see you at the next solar eclipse.